Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Dubcast with Dubside. I'm Andrew Lozaga, and Dubside will not be joining us today. And instead, I'll be speaking with George Gronseth, who is the founder and head instructor of the renowned Kayak Academy, the elite school for paddlers based in Issaquah, Washington. Before Greenland style kayaking became commonplace, George helped introduce Greenland style techniques to paddlers in the United States, and he's also a good friend of Dubside. Welcome, George. Thanks so much for being on the show. Well, thank you, Andrew. One of the things that got me started uh, with Greenland paddling was uh, there used to be a kayaking shop here in the Northwest and South of Seattle called Pacific Water Sports, and they had a really good book collection. And one of the books that piqued my interest was uh, a Smithsonian Institute publication, The Bark Canoes and Skin Boats of North America. And back this is back in the 80s, and at that time, pretty much anybody that was interested in you know traditional kayak stuff, that was like their go-to book. And so I picked that up, and one of the interesting things there, because this will come up a lot, was John Heath contributed some of the drawings and there was an appendix to this book about the kayak roll, which John Heath wrote that. Um, There's illustrations of how to do a roll and just kind of some hints about how to hold the paddle for different Greenland, well, standard roll, but also what he called some trick rolls. And uh, so he has, you know, like your arms crossed and things like that holding the paddle. And he doesn't go into any details on that, but it just kind of like gets it started a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, and then, of course, back in the 80s, um, before the Internet, there were magazines. And there was a magazine called Sea Kayaker. And uh, it had a history column, in, I think, in every issue. And uh, John Heath um, was one of the main contributors to the history column in Sea Kayaker magazine. So John had uh, uh, a long history going back to at least the early 60s of um, an interest in Arctic kayaks and some of the native kayakers, both in Alaska and Greenland, that he met and some of their techniques and things. He wrote some really good articles for the magazine, and one of them was about rolling with the Greenland paddle and forward paddling with uh, the sliding stroke. And then one that was really helpful to everybody was he wrote a whole article with details about building a Greenland paddle with good illustrations and stuff of all the cross sections of the blade and the loom and everything. There was like, I don't know, as far as I know, it was like the first really good explanation of, you know, what all the details are to make a good Greenland paddle. So for a long time, everybody referred to that if they were building a Greenland Pal. But prior to that, um, there were some commercial paddles that kind of marketed themselves as maybe not Greenland paddles, but like Werner made one, I think it was called the Arctic Wind. And uh, there was a wooden paddle called the uh, Quill. And I mean, like from... You know, a hundred yards away, you could kind of say they look a little like traditional paddles, <laughs> but but the fatal flaw was, at least as far as like Greenland stuff that I consider, is that they had just a round loom or shaft, and uh, whereas like all the real paddles that I've seen in Greenland, it's, the loom is like rectangular with rounded off corners and stuff, and like I'd tried those paddles and wasn't impressed with them. But then John Heath's article on how to build a grand paddle showed, you know, a, a paddle with the traditional kind of rectangular sort of loom. So I'd wanted to build that. But along the way, right around that time, there were some things, some opportunities happened. There was um, the Native Association in Kodiak Island. I don't remember the exact name of them. They had a guy named Tom Watson that worked for them. And they put on a... Uh, Skin Boats of Antiquity Conference on Kodiak Island in Alaska. Hmm. And um, they invited John Heath. Again, the name keeps coming up there. 
And John Heath was there, and John had also invited and hosted um, two Greenland kayakers, one who was um, at the time uh, the president of Kayak uh, I hope I pronounced that right, and one that was the national kayak champion at the time, John Peterson mm-hmm. from Greenland. So John Peterson did, did two uh, rolling demos, one in a pool there in Kodiak and one in a bay out in the saltwater. And I remember the pool he thought was too warm because <laughs> <laughs> he had his dewy luck on and everything. And I don't think he'd ever been in a pool before. <laughs> Anyways, you know, I, I introduced myself to the Greenlanders and, and I'd been corresponding with John Heath in the past and stuff. So I think I knew John a little bit before. And they were inviting people to come to Greenland the next uh, year in spring, summertime for their then uh, every other year they put on a, uh, a Greenland um, training camp, hmm. kayak training camp. And at the time they were doing their national kayak championship every other year. So one year there'd be a, a training camp and then the following year there'd be a competition and it went back and forth like that. Anyway, so the next year was going to be their uh, training camp year. And so I went away from the conference and all and, you know, and I thought about it and it was like, yeah, I want to go to the training camp. Wow. So um, I was the only person from the U.S. who uh, attended the training camp that time and and really the only one uh, that went through the whole training camp because then a few years later, then they went to having the competitions every year and, and then the training camps sort of instead of one national training camp, then they just sort of each town would do their own training and stuff like that. So it was a a two week intensive uh, kayak training camp. And uh, it was in the area near the town of Narsak, Greenland, and uh, which is south, uh, southwestern Greenland. So uh, how was it communicating with the Greenlanders um, (laughs) during this uh, training camp? Um, for me, that was difficult. You know, before I went, I didn't know any of their language, of course. And uh, before I went there, there was a bookstore in in Seattle near the U District that uh, was like Worldwide Books or something. And I went there trying to find a uh, like you know uh, English to Greenland dictionary or something, and there weren't any. And uh, uh, the best I could do was they had a like an English to Danish and then a Danish to Greenlandic one. And I thought about that and it was just like, there's no way that you could <laughs> translate between two different ones like that. So I didn't even bother with that, but I did get a map of Greenland. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I went there not speaking any of their language and not speaking Danish, which uh, if I'd known about it, like speaking Danish would have been a big help. Uh-huh. Um, Cause in Greenland, Danish was is the official language, and so the native people start out uh, speaking at home Greenlandic, but when they go to school, then they have to speak Danish. English would be not a second language, but like a fourth or fifth language, because they'd probably also speak German and some other European languages before they'd learn English. And also in Greenland, though, there was of the ones who spoke English there would be this big divide, generational divide. There were some of the older men who had worked on U.S. Air Force bases in Greenland and picked up some English there. And then there would be like young high school kids who now in some of the high schools, they offer English as a foreign language. And nobody in between, <laughs> age-wise, hmm. spoke any English at all. Um, John Peterson didn't uh, speak any English? He may. I can't remember for sure. He okay. may have a little bit. But, like, when he was inviting me to come to the training camp, uh, he was, like, sketching out, like, a tent to, say, camp um, <laughs> okay. on a piece of paper and all. <laughs> So, like, you know, he he may have spoke some English, but not real fluent. Mm -hmm. So anyways, um, they had arranged for me to have a a host when I was there. And my host spoke some English. But uh, to kind of give an example, the first 
night that I was there, um, staying in his house, he, he was afraid that maybe being an American, I might be a vegetarian. <laughs> um, but he didn't know the word for that. And so, you know, he asked me something and he kind of paused for a moment and he goes, do you, uh, eat only flowers <laughs> <laughs> and you know and i figured out what he meant and it was like no it's okay i'll eat meat <laughs> um and uh but he had worked on an air force base and so he had learned english from from that but then after that there was like hardly anybody that i ran into until when we were at the camp and the camp was on a remote island and uh there were 50 some people out there at the camp and stuff and there was a uh, like a probably sophomore in high school boy who uh who spoke pretty good english and so as much as i could i kind of stand next to him and ask him questions and then after about the second or third day i realized like this isn't gonna work because first of all it's like you know imposing on other people to ask them to translate everything for me and then also i just can't always have somebody be around somebody who speaks English and all. And I thought, I've got to somehow try to figure out some of this. And so I had a little uh, pocket sized notebook with me and pencil and stuff. So I asked um, Hendrick, I think was the high school guy's name. And uh, I asked him like just some things from, you know, like phrases for how do you say this and point to something and then uh you know and hello and goodbye and thanks and things like that and i started making my own dictionary <laughs> and and it really worked after after a few days you know as long as i as long as i posed all questions to be like yes or no questions <laughs> then uh i could get by a lot with that after college i actually took my first foreign language class of spanish and and it and it just occurred to me it was like well what was the approach of teaching spanish and it's like okay the first thing you got to do is some pleasantries and a few phrases and yes or no things and stuff like that and nouns and stuff and then i just started making my own dictionary based on that and it also kind of occurred to me like think of all the the missionaries who went to places with no knowledge of the language and learned to speak it and all and it's like I must have been doing this kind of thing. (laughs) What do you think of the way they taught uh, kayaking and and rolling? The way they taught rolling was pretty much the way that uh, most people would do it. The instructor would be standing in the water next to you, and it's one-on-one instruction, or sometimes even two instructors and, and one person in the kayak. But the way they were doing it, I think is probably quite traditional in that most everybody who was a student was really a beginner, like probably never been in a kayak before. No. Whereas, you know, we might take a beginner who's signed up for a lesson and, you know, teach them how to do a capsize and wet exit and rancher rescues. They would put them in the, in the kayak and near shore, start working on hip saps and rolling right away. Mm-hmm. And so they learned that the roll is your, you know, your safety go-to if you capsize. Because in in Greenland, uh, well, and in traditional stuff, they didn't have wetsuits and dry suits, and the, and the water in the Arctic is so cold, you didn't have much time if you came out of the kayak and and all with no uh, thermal protection for the water, immersion protection. And so they stayed in the boat and rolled. And so that was the way they were teaching it. So the first thing you learned was rolling. And when you learned to roll, then you learned to roll on your other side. And when you could roll well on both sides, then you learned to roll different ways. (laughs) And you learned to roll different ways on both sides. And then when you could roll, I don't know, at least three different ways on both sides, then you could go out in groups of like three or four people who would be in kind of a star pattern with all their bows pointing at one another and practice rolling um, a little ways offshore. But if you didn't roll up, then somebody could raft up alongside you or give the, give you their bow and uh, so that you could do a, a rescue without coming out of the kayak and bring yourself back up by using the bow or the side of another kayaker's boat. Hmm. 
So this was 1990, correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was 1990. So what was the state of rolling among sea kayakers in, in the Pacific Northwest? <laughs> um, if you asked most sea kayakers in the Northwest, they said that you couldn't roll a sea kayak. Wow. Um, that was that was pretty much um, common knowledge, that you couldn't roll a sea kayak. <laughs> wow. And uh, as a sea kayaker, if you took a rolling lesson somewhere, then usually what they did was put you in a river kayak and taught you to roll <laughs> instead of teaching you to roll with your own equipment and sea kayak. And so here the emphasis was on getting out of the kayak and getting back in doing deep water ranter rescues. Wow. When did that change? I mean, it must have shifted. Gradually. 91, I started the Kayak Academy. And so one of the things I would often do in just my, you know, paddle strokes kind of lesson towards the end, I would demonstrate some rolls in a sea kayak. Mm-hmm. So I could dispel that, that you couldn't roll a sea kayak. But then the next thing that would come up would be people would say, well, that's all fine, but you can't roll a sea kayak if it's loaded with camping gear. <laughs> so then when I would be on trips with, with people and uh, overnight trips where we had the gear, then I would roll with the uh, gear in my boat. So I could dispel the idea that you couldn't roll a sea kayak if it was loaded with camping gear. And after doing that for a while, you know, I was teaching people to roll in sea kayaks. And, uh, and then when we'd go out on the overnight camping trips and stuff, I would turn to the students and say, let's, let's try rolling now. And I'd get the students to roll with loaded boats. And it's like, well, if, if people who just learned to roll the day before can now roll in a loaded sea kayak, <laughs> then yes, it can be done in a loaded sea kayak and you don't have to be a super athlete to do that. Normal people can do this. Now, over the years, the kayaks have gotten a lot better at rolling because back in the 80s and early 90s, most of the commercially made sea kayaks had mechanical rudders. Back then, pretty much all the kayaks that had a mechanical rudder had sliding foot pedals with then, say, a steel cable going from the sliding pedal to the back end of the boat with the rudder. And even if you pushed equally with both feet, the steel cables would stretch um, like a rubber band about maybe half an inch or so, which gave you less control of the kayak and uh, made things like doing your hip snap less powerful and making rolling uh, more challenging and all. So that was a handicap. And then along the way, somebody started producing uh, rudder pedals that worked like a gas pedal in the car where you had a, a fixed hinge point to brace against, but then you could you know, hinge it from there with your toes to steer the rudder that way. And that gave a big improvement as far as having decent foot braces. And and then later, some of the kayak companies started offering boats with a a retractable skeg instead of a rudder. And with that, then you just had nice, solid foot braces, adjustable for different leg length, but fixed once you put them in the position you wanted. And that made everything a lot easier, not just rolling, but even forward paddling and steering and edging and all that. So all that was a help. And then also, if you go back to pretty much all the boats, like back in the 80s, there were a lot of sea kayaks built in the Northwest around Seattle area and in uh, British Columbia and Vancouver and stuff. But they weren't Greenland style kayaks. They were more, more like kind of the Alaska kayaks, which most of the traditional kayaks in Alaska were actually sat in kneeling and used a single blade paddle. Like it's basically a deck canoe. Mm -hmm. 
and you can roll those boats, but it's a different kind of roll than when you're sitting with your legs out in front. If you're, uh, if you're kneeling, then your center of gravity is higher, so you need a more stable kayak, which generally means it's going to be wider, which at some point can make rolling more difficult. Mm -hmm. And also, if you're kneeling, the deck height can be a lot higher without interfering with your paddling and even rolling. But a lot of the kayaks in the Northwest, I feel, were influenced by those types of traditional kayaks, or they may have even been influenced by folding kayaks, which have other constraints about the shape of them and stuff. And so they had quite high back decks. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that kind of precluded being able to do a layback roll, like a standard Greenland roll. After you came back from Greenland and started teaching rolling, did you use the standard Greenland roll as the basis for, for those rolls? Even then and still today for beginners, I'll kind of have two different paths that I take. It could be either that or uh, like a whitewater C to C roll. Mm -hmm. I like to try people to do the C to C first because that is so similar to just doing a high brace to prevent capsizing. But then some people, if they don't have good hip snap, well, then doing a standard Greenland roll is a great way to get them started. And then as soon as people can roll one way, then, then I like to have them start learning other ways to roll. So then I'll do the standard Greenland roll as a second one, if not. And also hybrids in between the two. Mm-hmm. But uh, a lot of my students, especially way back then, they didn't have kayaks that you could do a standard green roll in. That came later, um, mostly due to the British-style kayaks and all that were more like the Greenland-style boats with the flat rear deck and lower rear decks and things. So at one point, the British-style kayaks without rudders were introduced. When did that happen? When did people start moving away from using ruddered kayaks? Well, there were probably a few fiberglass uh, British kayaks here in the 70s, but they weren't popular. Mm. <laughs> and, and the few at the time were fairly tippy and had small cockpits, and, uh, and that kind of scared off most, uh, most American kayakers at the time. But um, little by little, then uh, like the Nord cap started to catch on a little bit. It had its own sort of cult following. However, early on, like back when I started uh, kayaking in the early 80s, there were only two books on how to sea kayak. And uh, one was actually called Sea Canoeing because the, the term sea kayaking hadn't really become popularized yet and that was uh Derek Hutchinson's mm -hmm. book the title was changed to sea kayaking in later editions there was that and there was John Dowd's book that was sea kayaking this changed over the years in different editions but in the like at least I think first edition of John Dowd's book I counted it one time he spent more pages talking about how dangerous it would be to use a British style kayak <laughs> than what the number of pages on how to paddle a kayak. <laughs> and so he had all kinds of arguments for why a narrow tippy boat would be unseaworthy and a small cockpit and things like that. And only a couple pages on how to paddle. Maybe, what, a, few, uh, maybe a few pages. What kayak was he paddling? Well, mostly folding like kleppers at the time. And, you know, I mean, to be fair, his thing, he liked doing trips, uh, you know, like weeks long trips in the Caribbean and, and sailing with a kayak between islands and things. And you need a different kayak for that. Yeah. And uh, so that was, I think, kind of his reference there. And rather than the sport and paddling close to shore and going in and out between sea stacks and things and surfing and stuff like that. Yeah, I remember reading his book, and among the supplies that he recommended you take were um, 
a snorkel and fins. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, yeah. I was thinking, I don't know if this really applies to uh, uh, my environment. Right. And on the flip side, Derek Hutchinson's book talked about bringing an ice axe and stuff. <laughs> and, and, and it actually went into, I think, like some, you know, glacier uh, safety issues and, and things like that. And it was like, why is this in a kayaking book? <laughs> yeah. So that was all there was at the time. The folding kayaks had an influence on some of the early fiberglass kayaks in the Northwest. And folding kayaks all have, almost, pretty much all have a peaked deck just by the nature of being able to kind of like uh, having a ship in a bottle kind of thing. There's some constraints about putting the frame into the skin of a, of a folding kayak and all. Mm-hmm. It was difficult to teach uh, rolling with boats with a tall peak deck and really wide and things like that. And back at the time, uh, most of them didn't really have a knee brace or like in a skin on frame Greenland kayak, the uh, Masik, you know, they didn't have anything to really brace with. And in fact, you know, if you pulled hard, you might just slip your knees out of the cockpit. And all. So I was often having to modify my students' kayaks with some foam and things to make them better and, and building up foam hip pads for them and all. And actually, you know, you went back about teaching beginners to do a standard green and roll and things. And, and what I consider one of the one of the few really improvements of modern kayaks is the hip braces. As far as I can find, I never see any traditional Arctic kayaks that have any kind of a hip brace to them, other than the combing maybe. Mm-hmm. And like when you'd see like John Peterson, if you had some of the old videos of him demonstrating rolling, and even Maligiak today too, is uh, you know after they finish the roll, they pause when they're upright and stable for a moment, and then you see a little shift, and they're centering themselves again because while they were doing the roll, their body slid, which may even be an advantage to some some rolls, mm-hmm. uh, but their body slid off center a little bit, and so if you don't have much of any hip support, then the C to C roll is not very effective. But with most modern sea kayaks, we have the sides of the seat keep us centered there. And we can use that to do the hip snap. And so then the C to C style roll can be very effective. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Whereas like in a standard green roll, I mean, you're doing some hip snap, but but you don't rely on that hip support on the side of the seat to do it. In fact, I feel there's even multiple ways of hip snaps. There isn't just one hip snap. There's different styles of hip snap. And and a lot of the different Greenland rolls use different ways of using your body for what we call the hip snap. Hmm. Say in a, in a standard Greenland roll, I mean, basically with the hip snap, what we're trying to do is get some torque to twirl the boat up. Mm-hmm. And as you lay back, your backside is pressing down on the combing and can be off center as it does that, like initially say the high side, and you can be lifting up on the massic with the knee on the low side. Mm -hmm. And you can get torque in the boat that way instead of a combination of the hip brace and the knee. Anyways, that's a whole other subject. So then when I came back from Greenland, I went around and gave like slideshows at a lot of the area kayak clubs about my experience there and for the most part didn't really get a lot of enthusiasm <laughs> and then it was just uh, too, back uh, that, too strange for people or yeah yeah it was yeah. just like what's that <laughs> well you know uh, uh i wanted to mention you were my first sea kayak instructor my first course in sea kayaking was a weekend class with you and uh lake sammamish and isqua i i remember you brought out a greenland paddle Funny at the time because I have absolutely no interest in in it at all. It just seemed, uh, you know, an alien, um, yeah, uh, kind of <laughs> like primitive Martian. instrument. So mm-hmm. uh, I didn't understand the potential for it at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like I'd go around to the 
clubs and give a slideshow about my experience with learning the kayak Greenland way and stuff. And I was like, okay, that's, that's weird. <laughs> and then, uh, back at that time, there were also lots of, uh, sea kayak symposiums all over the country. And I'd, I'd give uh, talks about it at some of the kayak symposiums as well. And, and then I wrote an article for, uh, sea kayaker magazine about my experience and that aroused a lot of interest, but, in mostly a very negative way Hmm. Um, because in the article that I wrote for Sea Kayaker, I talked about one of the things that was like a revelation to me was how the Greenlanders hold the paddle in their forward, in their forward paddling. And unlike with the Euro paddle, they hold the paddle so that relative to your hand, the blade is going to be naturally having a slight and I emphasize slight diving blade angle as you begin your forward stroke. Whereas that would be a no-no with a Euro style paddle. Today, the analogy maybe would be say, you know, Reddit and the threads on that. Well, there would be these letters to the editor in the magazine. Then the magazine would offer the, if it was something controversial, the magazine would give an advance notice of these letters to the editor, to the original author of an article, and then you could reply to these letters. And and then there'd be the next issue of the magazine would be replies from the people who wrote the letter to the editor would be replying back and all. And these would go back and forth for on and on for many issues and stuff. So some of the people picked up on what I'd written about holding the paddle blade this way. And they thought I was mistaken and I was all wrong. They knew they had a Greenland paddle or at least what they thought was a Greenland paddle. And that's not how they use it and stuff like that. But you, I, you had learned from the Greenlanders. themselves. Yeah. 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 And so finally, after this had gone back and forth for several issues of the magazine, I think I suggested that, People ought to just take the time that they're spending to write these letters and build a Greenland paddle and go try it. <laughs> and like use use John Heath's article to make a good Greenland paddle and go try it. Of course, you know, that's not the way people are. With maybe one exception, and you'll know this name was uh Greg Stamer. He picked up on what I'd written and and I think he either emailed or wrote me a letter. And we had some correspondence for a while, and then and, and I know that he went back and, and tried that, and then he he understood. And then in the years that followed that, an interesting thing happened, was the article got forgotten about, and the ACA was um, about to uh, offer a Greenland kayaking instructor certification program. And John Heath had uh, hosted Maligiak Padilla, who was the then national kayak champion uh, from Greenland. And he was going around the U.S. and giving uh, demonstrations of Greenland rolling and stuff. And at one of those demonstrations, I think it was in Texas, there were some people there that were part of the ACA program who saw Maligiak forward paddling and noticed that he was holding the paddle wrong (laughs) and uh, with a slight diving blade angle. And as a result of that, they decided to shelf the uh, Greenland kayaking technique certification, at least for a long time. (laughs) Wow. Because... They felt that they really didn't know. They realized that if they're not even holding the paddle the same way the <laughs> Greenlanders do, then maybe they shouldn't be certifying others to teach this. Yeah. Wow. I don't remember what year that was, but probably in the late 90s, something like that. Mm-hmm. Now, I know uh, in general, you're not a big fan of certification. Is that right? At least not at this time, because I feel like just like that awakening, uh, I feel that the sport is still too immature to be um, standardizing certain ways. And so maybe in the future, but I don't think we're there yet. Oh, okay. 
Back when I took that course with you, that was my first time wearing a dry suit, and I was just totally impressed with it, and immediately ordered one from you. Are you still the number one dry suit retailer in North America? Well, we've never been the number one. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> That's I mean, what I'd heard. There's some big stores like REI and stuff. But uh, of the specialty shops, we are Kokatat's number one dealer. Yes. Okay. How did dry suits get introduced into sea kayaking, and when did that happen? You know, when I started kayaking, I pretty much simultaneously started sea kayaking and whitewater kayaking. I mean, my very, very first time, I put in on a flatwater section of the Cedar River and paddled out into Lake Washington. It wasn't whitewater, but I was on a river at the very beginning, and then I was on the lake the same day. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that, I bought my first river kayak, and then not long after that, actually the first kayak that I had was kind of what we would say today would be a recreational kayak, although that term hadn't been invented yet. Mm -hmm. It was homemade. Uh, so not long after that, I bought my first river kayak, and not long after that, I bought my first true sea kayak. And, you know, and I started doing both and taking lessons with the Washington Kayak Club, first in sea kayaking and, and then a year later in whitewater kayaking. I had a wetsuit, a wetsuit Farmer John and a jacket that I was paddling in all the time. And on just a class one plus section of the Skagit River during a winter Eagle float trip, I capsized. And the water was extremely cold. Like, you know, there was snow and everything. And uh, after that, I wanted to get a wet or I wanted to get a dry suit. So there was a, a German made dry suit. I think the brand was Rucka. And it was a two piece suit. And you rolled the, there were flaps in the, around the waist that you rolled up like a dry bag. And it didn't make a perfect seal, but, you know, it was a lot better than being in a wetsuit. And so I used that, and that was a game changer for me. And I had other friends at the time that I told about that, and pretty much all my friends, I got them to get dry suits too. And then we were we were well set, and we could go out and practice in cold water and go paddling in cold weather year-round and stuff, because here in the Northwest, the water generally doesn't freeze up. So if you have good cold weather and immersion gear and all you can paddle year round and um so i took that of course i bought it first thinking for the river paddling but immediately started using it for both whitewater and sea kayaking so then when i started the kayak academy i invested in a bunch of wetsuits to loan students and because uh, usually beginner students don't have their own equipment and all and uh, But if I were going to stand in the cold water for a long period of time, like teaching, you know, wet exits or rolling, um, then I would use my dry suit. Well, of course, that wasn't very consistent. So the students would say, I want a dry suit, you know. <laughs> and so after a little bit, then I started investing in dry suits to loan to the students. And most of my classes were at least two days long. And so early on when I had the dry suits, I'd let the students use the dry suit the first day for free. And then the second day, I'd have them switch to a, a wetsuit. And that was okay until like one time I was teaching a class and it was middle of July, which you'd think would be nice, but it was a really stormy, rainy day. And uh, on the second day when all the students were in a wetsuit, I had to cancel the class at lunch because people were just shivering uncontrollably and all that. And, uh, you know, and I, and I just had the suspicion that, oh man, if only they'd been in dry suits, there'd be no problem. In that same summer in August, there was like a similar weather pattern on another weekend. And so on the second day of the class, it was stormy and cold and rainy, like crazy and everything. And I decided, well, even though normally I have everybody go with, a wetsuit on the second day, I'm going to let you guys use a dry suit today. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the class went fine and everybody was comfortable and we didn't have to cancel it at the middle of the day and stuff. And so that really changed my perspective on that. 
So from then on, you know, like I would, if it was hot weather and people didn't want the dry suit, fine. They could go with a wet suit or they could go in their bathing suit if they wanted. But at least I offered them to use a dry suit. And that also changed the teaching because, you know, you could spend more time in the water. You could do more stuff upside down and teaching rolling and everything else. So that changed the whole teaching at the Kayak Academy, having everybody being in dry suits most all the time, unless it was just really, really hot. That was a game changer for me, too, to have a dry suit. I mean, it was just a a huge improvement in um, comfort and safety. Yeah. I have to tell you that that dry suit that I bought from you, I spent, um, you know, like $900 for it back in, I think it was like 2004 or something. Kokotat dry suits came with a lifetime warranty. So seven years later, that suit starts to leak and I sent it back to Kokotat. And they said, oh, you know, it's starting to delaminate, but because of this warranty, we're gonna replace it for free. So they replaced it. And then I got another seven years out of it. (laughs) The new suit starts to leak and I sent it back to them and they replaced it again. Wow! So it was like one of the best purchases I ever made. And so I still have, yeah. uh, I still have uh, basically a brand wow. new suit. That's great. Yeah. Maybe they wouldn't have uh, replaced it if they already knew that it had been replaced once before. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, no, they would still stand behind that even. Just as a note on that, though, uh, some people think that if they just send their suits back to Kokotat, they'll always get a replacement. And it's like, no, that, you know, it's if there's a warranty issue. Mm-hmm. So like I always make the analogy, I mean, Denim and blue jeans are pretty rugged, but if you wear the same blue jeans, you know, every day after six months to a year, it's going to have holes at the knee and stuff. And that wouldn't be a warranty with a dry suit. Then it's like, you've had a lot of use and fun with this. It's it's time for you to buy a new dry suit. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the last time I checked the lifetime warranty, it's, it's more like expected lifetime. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, uh, our functional life or something like that. Yeah, they've they've reworded it a little bit to make it a little clearer now, which is good. Yeah, but uh, Kokotat is, a, um, I mean, their products are amazing and uh, their customer service is uh, excellent. Yeah. So you were instrumental in introducing dry suits into... Oh, uh, yeah, so then, so uh, yeah, so I introduced it to my friends, well, mm-hmm. to myself and then to my friends. And I mean, you know, obviously it, it was so much better for most things. Well, around the same time that I really got enough dry suits to loan to my students, then I became a dealer for Kokotat. So I had these dry suits to loan people. And then if they asked me, like, you know, because I wasn't wasn't a retailer, I just was a school at the time. And I did that on purpose as I wanted to be, like, I can say things about, you know, my opinions on stuff, and it's not biased because I'm not selling you anything. I'm just teaching lessons. Mm-hmm. But it was frustrating because then I'd tell my students, okay, you know, go to this store and you can buy a dry suit. And my students would call me up or come back on another lesson and they go, well, I went to the store and I told them I'm a sea kayaker and they wouldn't sell me a dry suit. They, they shuffled me over to where they have some rubber boots and, and, uh, and a jacket. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like... You know, this happened so many times. And it's like, well, if the stores don't want to sell my students dry suits, then I'll sell them to them. And so then I became a dealer for Kokotat and started selling dry suits to sea kayakers. I mean, it was just like Greenland kayaks and Greenland paddles and stuff. You know, there would be people like down in California that say, well, we don't need dry suits here because it's a lot warmer here than in the Northwest. Well, the weather's warmer, but you know, in Northern half of California, the water temperature is about the same as it is in the Northwest. So the shops down there wouldn't sell people a dry suit. And if they were a sea kayaker, maybe to a river kayaker, but not to a sea kayaker. And so people from California would call me up to buy a dry suit. Finally, the shops in California started catching on and they started selling dry suits. And then I'd get calls from people on the East Coast and the East Coast shops wouldn't sell sea kayakers dry suits. So they'd order them up from here in Washington. And then later on, the kayak shops in the East Coast started to sell dry suits to sea kayakers as well. So little by little, 
things changed. <laughs> wow, that's a that's amazing. When did they start making dry suits specifically for sea kayaking? Did you have any input into um, what features those kind of dry suits would have? Much later, I think probably their first dry suit would be a fine dry suit for sea kayaking. And actually, what became the standard still today for river kayaking is what Kogadet calls their meridian dry suit, which has has an overskirt around the middle. And that came out later. And so the early ones just had uh, uh, no overskirt, which is still today what most sea kayakers will choose for for their dry suit. Unless they're doing lots of rolling, then they want to overskirt as well. And then much later on, Kokatat decided to make a really high end of sea kayak dry suit that they called the Expedition. It's later, more recently, morphed into a suit they call the Odyssey, which has a hood and pockets on the sleeves, and, and it does have the overskirt and stuff and reflective material and so on. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was on that that I did have input because I may have been the first person to roll with the hood up. And when it came up, there was a flap across your mouth and nose. And when it was wetted, as you tried to inhale, it would just kind of stick to your face and you couldn't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I called him up right away and explained to them that you need to make changes here. So there were there were some, some things like that. So I've had some influence over the years. Back in the 60s, 70s, you know, the Northwest was a hot spot in the U.S. for sea kayaking as far as like Washington Kayak Club and then, you know, builders of fiberglass kayaks and all. Also in Seattle, there's this thing called the Center for Wooden Boats. And in like 89, um, they sponsored a Danish kayaker, Sven Alstrup, to come over and teach a class on building your own Greenland kayak. And so I wanted to do that. This was even before I went to Greenland. So I took that class and built my first Greenland kayak. And then I went to Greenland not long after that. And when I came back from Greenland, I wanted to build a a paddle. And so I had this article that John Heath had written about how to make a Greenland paddle. And the winter before this, there had been a really huge windstorm that went through western Washington and the San Juan Islands and knocked down lots of old trees in the San Juans. So for a little while, there were lumber yards that had these beautiful, clear, straight-grained two-by-fours of cedar from local woods, and uh, there were like old-growth cedars. So I selected a, a nice specimen from that and built my first Greenland paddle. You know, if I had made the loom longer and a little thicker, that would still be my main Greenland paddle. I still have it today, but I erred on the side of making the loom a little short and a little small for my body. But I I played around a lot with the blades on that, kind of like starting out with a blade oversized and changing the shape as I finished it and all. Plus, it was still in my mind what I'd what I'd seen and used when I was in Greenland and all. And that's still my favorite blade. In fact, years later, well, I built paddles to loan to students. And then I got students of different sizes. So I built smaller and larger Greenland paddles and all to fit different size students and everything. But even though there's different fits, I found that like some of the paddles that I had were just really magic and others not so much (laughs) and it was like puzzling it's like why does this one just feel so much more powerful and give you lots of lift when you're rolling and everything and this other one that looks the same yeah not so much (laughs) and so one time i i went down to the lake with all my greenland pals like i had 10 or 12 of them 
and I just waded out in the water, like almost waist deep or so, and uh, and just had all these paddles floating around me. And I would pick up one paddle and, you know, kind of simulate forward paddling, simulate sculling high brace and things like that. And, uh, and then, you know, just kind of make a judgment of, I like this, I don't like this. And I, I split them into two groups. And then, you know, when I went to shore and all, then I started like looking at the, the good group and the bad group. And it's like, what's the difference between these? And, and I had some revelations from that which I actually still keep proprietary, <laughs> but uh, there are some very subtle details that can really make a difference in, in how the blade performs. Hmm. Anyway, so that was, that was my first Greenland paddle. And then some of those um, also back in the eighties, nineties, there were a lot of um, sea kayaking festivals and all. And there was one, uh, some kind of, I don't remember the name of it. I think it was only one or two years they put it on, but sort of a skin boats festival at Bowman Bay near Deception Pass. Mm-hmm. And it was organized by, I think, a guy from Bellingham at the time. I can't remember who. It's like 30 years ago now. But I was asked to uh, do a Greenland paddling uh, rolling demo there. And John Heath was also a speaker at this festival. And so... While I uh, was doing the rolling, John was on shore doing the narration, and he was kind of coaxing me along to do some of the more difficult Greenland rolls that I felt ashamed because I hadn't practiced them since the last time I was in Greenland and stuff, but I did my best and all. And then a year or so later, um, I met up with John Heath again at uh, at a sea kayak symposium up by Pictured Rocks in the uh, upper peninsula of Michigan. And that one, I think, was put on by uh, Great River Outfitters, which um, was Stan Shadlick's business. And he was the main uh, valley kayak importer at the time for a long time. So, again, there did some demos. And and they had a race with only traditional paddles. I had my paddle with me, but I had to borrow a kayak and and the only kayak that was left on the beach that I could use, it was kind of a traditional looking boat, was a, a Valley Anasakuda, mm-hmm. which is like a really slow boat because it's short and rockered and all. Mm-hmm. And uh, there were other people with long, fast looking kayaks and everything that were racing. And uh, so I knew I didn't have much chance. But started out and they started the race. And before long, everybody passed me. But the race course involved going out from shore, around a buoy, and then back. And so everybody else got to the buoy before me, but then with their long boats um, without much rocker and all, they were taking a long time to turn around. And I just laid that Anasakuda away over on its side and spun it in two strokes and beat everybody back to the beach. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. So how did you meet Dubside and Maligiak and um, get them together for this Greenland Week event? So let's see. Then skipping ahead many years, there was a um, Sea Kayak Symposium, either Tacoma or the West Coast Sea Kayak Symposium over in Port Townsend, where I met Dubside. Because by that time, Dubside was living in near Anacortes, Washington. And so he was going around to things like the kayak uh, symposiums here in the Northwest and doing demonstrations and all. And not long after that, Maligiak Padilla was in the U.S. again. I talked about him much earlier, like maybe 10 years before when he was just a teenager. But uh, he was back in the U.S. and teaching kayaking at some kayak symposiums and uh Kai Academy had an opportunity to host him to come here and teach Greenland kayaking lessons. And uh, so uh, we jumped on that. And Dubside was also involved because Dubside knew Maligiak because Dubside was going over to Greenland and competing and stuff all the time. And so uh, we hosted both Maligiak and Dubside here. 
And after that, Maligak was either staying around or coming back again the next year. And so we started making it an annual event and we called this Greenland Week. And so we would have a a week or so of of lessons on everything from Greenland paddling and rolling and uh and rope gymnastics and stuff. And towards the end of the week we had sort of an abbreviated kayak competition modeled after the Greenland National Championships with rolling as a competition, kayak racing, harpoon throwing, and the rope gymnastics as all part of that. So there was Dubside and Ligiak, not competing, but as both coaches and then uh, and judges for the events. And for a while, also Helen Wilson was part of that as well back then. I attended Greenland Week for a couple of years, and it was a fantastic event. It was, uh, I mean, we weren't doing it to make money, but, you know, as a business, you'd like to at least kind of break even. <laughs> and uh, it was a disaster as far as a business, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, too bad. Yeah. <laughs> because it would, would have been good to see it uh, continue. I think, though, that uh, sea kayaking in general took a hit after that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not a hit, but just kind of gradually decline. Yeah. Yeah. However, since the pandemic, that's definitely turned around. You authored a book with Matt Bros titled Deep Trouble, which is one of my favorite books. And my partner, Kati, just loves listening to those stories. I like to read them aloud when we're out camping and they, um, they make for great scary stories mm-hmm. around the campfire. You want to talk about how that came about? Sure. So again, um, this magazine, Backer, back in the 80s, 90s, uh, they had in every issue a safety column. Not the first issue, but maybe the second or third or so. Matt Bros, who was, uh, he and his brother founded uh, Mariner Kayaks, which was a, a brand of sea kayaks here in the Seattle area. After the first few issues, Matt Bros was the regular safety columnist for Sea Kayaker magazine. And so he, he kind of set the mold for these safety articles where when he'd find out about somebody who had an incident, he would try to interview uh, the people and find out what went wrong and what you could do to prevent that, uh, try to you know, make things safer for everybody from then on. And after doing that for a number of years, Matt really wanted to move on and focus on his other business of designing and building kayaks and stuff. And he was encouraging me to take that over as a uh, the um, safety columnist for the magazine. And I'd written some other safety articles for like the local kayak clubs and things like that in the meantime. And I wasn't sure about it, but I was on a kayaking trip up in Alaska and there happened to be a a kayaking accident in Blackstone Bay. And, you know, it was in the local papers there in Alaska, but it wasn't in the news down in Seattle. And so I gathered some information and then I called up some of the people that were on the trip and interviewed them. And, and so I wrote that up as my first safety article for Sea Kayaker magazine. Then before long, some other accidents happened. And, and I just kind of like, you know, I think maybe the magazine uh, sent me some info and asked me to, to look into it. So I started writing a, a regular safety column uh, for every issue of the magazine. Well, then after a number of years, there was a lot of material there. The magazine used to actually sell back issues. Mm -hmm. and People would order up old issues of the magazine if they didn't have them. But uh, eventually those were running out. So there was uh, enough interest in all of this that uh, there was lots of people suggesting. It's like, you ought to write a book and put all these articles together. And so... McGraw Hill actually, I think, approached the magazine and asked them for this. And then the magazine asked Matt Bros and I uh, to work on this project with uh, Chris Cunningham, who was the editor of the magazine at the time, also being the editor of this book. So basically, it was a compilation of the safety articles that Matt and I had written over many years for the magazine. And Matt wrote a forward to it with some safety suggestions, and and that became the uh, Sea Kayaker Deep Trouble. 
some years later, there was sort of a volume two called More Deep Trouble. Uh, I'm not listed as a co-author on that one, but I have like two or three of the stories in there were articles that I had also published in the magazine as well. And yeah, I think both of those, either one or both of those, is like every sea kayaker should read them, and especially people that are like instructors or guiding trips and things like that, sort of like you're doing. It's a great, great uh, resource to have and and uh, read some of the stories to your friends, like when you're out on trips and things. Yeah, I think it's a great way to teach and make people aware of the problems that can come up with uh, sea kayaking trips. At the time, it must have had a huge influence on how people looked at safety and, and equipment. For instance, yeah. the adequacy of flotation in your kayak, wearing dry suits, just being informed about the weather, all those things. Yeah, you know, at, at some point, I tried to look at doing a statistical analysis of what went wrong, and it doesn't work because it's too small of a uh, sample size. But there were trends, like with maybe two exceptions, almost all the stories were people without immersion wear. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that was definitely a contributing factor. And then buoyancy failures either because the boat just didn't have buoyancy, like either airbags or bulkheads in the ends, or, you know, like a hatch fell off and the flotation compartment filled with water and then it, then it sank. So those were two of the more common issues that uh, led to the seriousness of the accidents. You know, and I think there's many, many more times that people have say, accidentally capsized and didn't roll and got out of their boat. But most of the time, you know, if people have had a lesson and know how to get back in the kayak and pump it out and stuff, well, it doesn't get reported to the Coast Guard and it doesn't get written up in a newspaper or anything. So unless you happen to know these people, no one really hears about those things. So the ones that become, you know, newsworthy items are the ones where things really went wrong. And when things really went wrong, it was often the people didn't have immersion protection and buoyancy failures was another leading thing there. You know, and that was a lot of those stories were from 30 some years ago. Nowadays, wetsuits and dry suits are much more common in areas like the Northwest where water is generally cold, but not always. So it still applies, and most of the commercial sea kayaks that we think of as being real sea kayaks, not recreational boats, most of them now all come with front and rear bulkheads. Again, though, you could still have issues if you don't have backup buoyancy, like either dry bags with gear or a float bag inside the hatch. Well, if if a hatch came off, you could still have the same problem. But it's, you know, the equipment's gotten better. Most people, are, if they're doing anything where they're long crossings and things, are wearing uh, immersion protection if they're in cold water. So it's improved, but there's still accidents and fatalities, and, and there's still people out there that aren't taking uh, safety precautions. Do you look out for um, those news reports of kayak accidents? Yeah, I um, I haven't published anything in a long time, other than like when there's a newspaper one, I'll I'll just put a link to it. Mm-hmm. On, uh, I have a safety page on our website, although then those go away after a while and the links become uh, dead ends. But uh, when I find one that's in a local in a newspaper or something, I'll I'll try to put that up with a link to them. But I compile them so. Someday, if I had time, um, I have a big stack of, uh, of accidents that could be written up. What does the future hold for sea kayaking, do you think? Well, I think no matter what, just being out on the water and in your own boat is inspiring. I don't know what's the word. Just enjoyable to the extreme. So I think no matter what, there's still always going to be people that are going to be interested in it. And if they try it, they're going to like it. And 
and be going paddling. You know, now there's there's differentiation between Greenland style boats that make doing the, the rolling stuff a lot easier, facilitate even the more difficult, challenging rolls, as well as other touring sea kayaks with lots of room for camping gear and everything and you know hybrids in between and stuff so the equipment has certainly improved a lot over the last three four decades so there's lots of instructors now all over that can teach all these different aspects of the sport so there's opportunities for somebody if they're new to it they can get lessons they don't have to go to a once a once a year event or something like the symposiums used to be and they can probably find somebody if they live near the coast uh, they can probably find somebody locally to train them and uh, whether you're just doing local trips for just getting outside getting some exercise or doing longer expeditions even the longer expeditions there's uh, you know it used to be you had to bring your own kayak with you because there wasn't any place to rent a kayak but now pretty much all over the world. If you're near the ocean or anything, there's places to rent kayaks. The options are, are better than they've ever been before. One last question. How can people find you on the internet? Kayakacademy.com is generally one of the first things that will come up in the organic uh, listing if you were to Google it, because I wasn't the first kayak website, but I was one of the early ones. And so it usually comes up if you Google most anything about sea kayaking or dry suits. So they can either type in kayakacademy.com or just Google on sea kayaks and look for it. And that would be the easy way. On our website, we have uh, descriptions of our lessons, as well as an e-commerce store with dry suits and all other accessories for paddling. All right. Very good. Well, thanks so much, George. It was a real pleasure talking to you. Oh, well, thank you, Andrew. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Be sure to check out this week's show notes for links to the Kayak Academy, John Heath's video of the Skin Boats of Antiquity Kayak Conference of 1989, and videos of Kayak Academy's Greenland Week, featuring Helen Wilson, Dubside, and Maligiak Padilla. In our next episode, Dubside returns with our regular Dubcast. <laughs>